Hi, I'm Ned Smith. And I'm Reed Peterson, welcoming you again to Arizona Outdoors. Over the last few weeks, we received a number of inquiries concerning the format of our show and our call-ins. We probably should have explained this a couple of weeks ago, but here in the studio, we've had the breakdown of some really sophisticated equipment that uh, we had to send it clear out of state to be repaired. And as soon as that equipment is returned to us, we'll go right back to the format of our show with our call-ins. Now, speaking of that format, most of the summer we have concentrated here on our show on fishing because it was the fishing season. The hunting seasons are just around the corner and starting with next week's show, we will switch to the prime emphasis of our program to that sport out to the outdoor field into hunting. Uh, last week on our show, we took you to Lake Mead to the U.S. Open. This week, we're also going to take you out of state, but this time for something entirely different. Uh, to a sport and an activity that has really become popular here with Valley Fishermen. Ned, would you introduce our guest in our show? You bet, Reed. Tonight we have Mike Canapel, owner of Best Water Company and Anglers and Hunters Marine, which a lot of the sportsmen around our area know and they visit. In the old days they called it Peterson's, but you know, it's right here in Mesa and we've had a good time. Mike, uh, welcome to our show. Thank you, Ned. Thank we're, you, Reed. We're happy to have you here. And Mike and Reed went out and did a show on albacore fishing and that's really what our topic's gonna be about tonight. Reed, you might just kick right back in there on what we're gonna well, do on it. Before we do that, I was just going to say, uh, and speaking of, we're really happy to have you here, Mike, because Mike is a very special person. He is one of the top outdoorsmen that I know in the state of Arizona. He isn't just interested in fishing and fishing for albacore, but probably throughout the outdoor field, he's about as knowledgeable as anybody you'll come in, in contact with. In dealing with ballistics, for instance, he's a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> and uh, Mike, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Well, I appreciate those kind comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we received a call from Mike here a couple of weeks ago uh, inviting us on a trip to uh, the West Coast because the albacore season was on. And Mike, as I understand, this, this particular outdoor activity is becoming more popular with every day that passes with the valley fishermen. Is that correct? It sure is. In fact, since you did the article on albacore fishing, the interest has just been overwhelming. We, we can't even believe it. You've got more fishermen wanting to go out deep sea fishing than you even anticipated. Yeah, we, we were just kind of getting our feet wet this year and we scheduled five trips and they filled up so quick we probably could schedule five more trips but there just isn't the right kind of charters available right now so we're, we're waiting till next year and then we're going to try to schedule at least ten trips next year. Well, as I recall, Mike, the, the uh, reason that we went, went to uh, California on this particular time was actually to test the feasibility of whether it was worthwhile for the store to sponsor right. this. Is that correct? That's right. And the response was so great that you know for sure, starting well, we, next year, Anglers and Hunters Marine will be uh, booking these things right out of here in the definitely, valley. Definitely. Definitely. Now you're going to go for the quality type trip where you can have room and the guys can fish uh, instead right. of getting on a cattle boat more, more or less. <laughs> you know, some of those boats have 50, 60 anglers on them and you can't even move on them. And so what are you right. going to be well, doing? If, if the capacity to sleep on a boat might be, say, 60 people, we would not schedule any more than 30. So everybody would have a lot of room to fish, plenty of room to sleep, plenty of room to bring anything on board they want to bring on. Uh, we, however, are probably going to stay with the boats that will accommodate about 20 people and then take 8 or 10. Boy, that'd be neat. That'd be excellent type fishing. You get into those albacore and everybody could, you know, catch yeah, a lot sure. of them. Everybody will catch a lot of fish and uh, since we'll be the ones that will run it and occasionally you get into fishing where what you're after doesn't bite the way you want it to, so you go catch something else. Whereas if you're on a cattle boat, as I call them, and you go over to California and you're not catching any albacore, the captain's just going to stay out there and keep trying to catch them. And we ran into one the other day where they didn't catch any albacore and they didn't go to try to catch anything else. They came back with nothing and there were 62 yeah. people on the boat. <laughs> yeah. That's ridiculous. Well, we didn't go on any cattle boat, that's for sure over there. Yeah. But right now, let's just take time out for a commercial. Hi, Reed Peterson here. If there's one thing I hate to have on a trip, it's trouble with my tires. About a year ago, I bought a set of big old tires, as you can see here. And without question, they're the best set of tires I've ever owned. And I've bought quite a few over the years. I got top quality at a fair price. And you can too.
Visit my friends at Big O' Tires in Mesa, 420 East Main, 1060 South Alma School Road, and 100 South Power. Well, you know, Mike, I have never been albacore fishing, and that was an entirely new experience for me. In fact, I really didn't do much fishing anyway, as you know. I got behind that camera most of the time, but it was really interesting. And, and one of the things that I thought was kind of neat about it, some people might not, not think so, but, uh, you know, we left here at noon one day. We traveled over there just in time to get on a boat. We traveled all night, got out some 65 miles out to sea. Got up just in time to start fishing, fish during the day. Three o'clock we head in, we get back in late in the evening, load up and drive all the way back home and we're back in Mesa before daylight the next morning. Well, that might not sound real uh, something exciting to most people, but what it did, it allowed all these businessmen to take that one day off and we were over there and back in one day and I thought that was phenomenal. Plus, we had amazing success. Well, I think that's pretty typical because you have a lot of people doing it on the weekends and there's a lot of people that can take off a day and a half and go during the week. And mm -hmm. Usually it's like fishing here on the lakes in Arizona. The fishing is going to be better if you can avoid all of the people that are there on the weekends. And I, I kind of think albacore fishing might be the same way. That sounds right. Well, that albacore fishing was something else. I, I, I didn't really know what to expect going over there, but all the other fellows seemed to have uh, have been there before, so it was kind of old hat to them, but it was entirely new to me, and I, it, it was exciting from the start to the finish. Yeah, I, and I think catching as many albacore as we did is pretty good proof that uh, they're not the hardest fish in the world to catch, and, and uh, the people that are watching the show will see some pretty good action. Yeah, they're strong fighters. Well, as, we, as we go into this tape, I think that's one thing that we need to stress that, uh, you know, you just about have to take a charter boat. If you're going out 65 miles out to sea, you wouldn't be want to be take my, my 15 foot bass boat. No. Not on that ocean. In fact, uh, I found it very difficult to film. It was really totally amazing. Stand up on top of that thing, I almost fell off two or right. three times. <laughs> and that was a calm day, too. Yeah, if you get out on those roller coasters that go two and three you know, stories high, you're in trouble. We were out there last Saturday and it was so rough you just about didn't feel secure unless you're wearing a life jacket all day long. Yep. There's eight foot white caps and it was really rough. Yep. Well, it's scary. Well, Mike, let's just move right into the tape right now. Okay. Okay, what we're doing here is the boat has stopped to load some bait and usually this time of year they're putting in anchovies. I don't. Where, where do they get these anchovies out there? I well, know the boat got, just pulls up and starts unloading them. They've got uh, some bait barges that uh, troll with large nets, and they catch them. Well, I've seen them out by the kelp beds catching them, and I guess there's other places where they catch them. But that's the main thing that's used this time of year for bait. Uh, right. What they're doing here is they're doing some trolling, and you troll that's, feathers. That's, that's kind of the format of, the, of this right. boat. But I don't know whether the particular boats have their own way or not, but he would troll, put four guys back there, and they would alternate, but they would go until we received a hit. Is that right, Mike? Right. They'd, they'd go until you get a strike, and then all the people that were trolling would pull their artificial lures in, and then people would throw out bait. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that the guy that had <laughs> hooked the fish would pull all the other fish in with him, and then the people that were fishing with bait would be able to catch a fish. Here's Art right here uh, over. He's yeah, your you here's Art Chamberlain. Art yeah, uh, he's got one. Boy, you're not a. He's kitten. your store manager. Is that right? Right. right. Boy, he's well, got Artist from Fountain Hills, and right there, that's the beginning of an unbelievable day. Just just got started there. They're strong fighters, don't you feel, Mike? Oh, they're just super fish to catch. You you can't appreciate how strong they are till you catch one. You've got to have decent equipment too. You don't take a bass rod out there. Well, about the smallest thing you can use is a flipping stick. If most of the people in the valley are, they're watching the show are bass fishermen, they're probably used to flipping sticks. Mm -hmm. Now there's 15 of us here from the valley, and uh, you can see them really starting to pull these things in. The guy you'll be able to see out of the corner there. Stand, well, there's Mike there at the back of the boat now, and taking up the trolling position. But uh, and the rest of them just sit there. If they're not part of the four-man trolling, they're waiting to pick up real quickly one of those those anchovies and uh, they right. hook it right behind the gills, is that right? Yeah, you can see how they're hooking them here. That's one of the ways to do it. You can hook them through the nose or through right behind the gills or there's a couple of ways to hook them through the nose. Any of the ways are effective. Now that guy standing there, Mike, is really interesting. He's part of the boat crew, is that right? And, and as soon as they get a strike, he starts throwing anchovies right. on all sides of the boat. Just chums right. them. Yeah. Just chums them to try to keep them up 
because if they dive down, you're not going to be able to reach them. So the idea is to keep them up and get as many fish in the boat as you can get as quickly as possible because they don't stay around too long. And what we ended up doing is we would go from school to school and sometimes there'd be an hour or two in between schools and other times it would be a longer period of time. And you, you just have to keep doing this all day long. That's just the, pretty much the way that albacore are caught. That guy they just caught one was Floyd Thompson from Tempe. Boy, you can sure get tangled up around in there too in a hurry, can't you? <laughs> it's a nightmare, <laughs> especially on that boat. We had as, as many as six hookups at one time and you have to follow the fish around the boat. And when you're following them around the boat, whoever doesn't have one on, if their line gets tangled up with yours, you have to cut it. See, they're uh, making way for the guy with the fish here. As they do that, you see that fellow there with a, the little dip net. He dips the, the anchovies out of that main, bo main pool where they're in and puts them on those little bait things so the guys can get them in a hurry. Is that right, Mike? Right. Yeah, well, he's really got a nice one on. Look at that. That's a good rod there, and it's really bending over. Boy, I'll tell you. Well, Mike, here, tell here's us some what you're the, doing here. Here's some of the different lures that you can use to troll with, and you can do other things with them, but this is a feathered jig. And that's supposed to look somewhat like a squid, is that right? Something like a squid, right. And it doesn't have very much weight because they're trolled just below the surface, maybe six, eight inches, maybe a foot below the surface, and that's it. With various different colors. It seems like the time we were out, green was the best color to use. And here's some weight that you use. Usually you're going to be using anywhere from uh, about a half an ounce up to maybe a couple ounces at the very most. Here's a spoon. Now, yeah. you've opened a new salt, uh, salt water tackle uh, division over at Anglers Right. What we're trying to do is to supply the fishermen with the things that they would use down in Mexico or over in California. So you have all this there. hooks. Right. We have all the hooks. Those little old hooks words. are not very big. I was surprised, Mike, how small those hooks were that you used. Yeah. A number two hook is a, is a number two or a number four hook is the size hooks you use. And if you look at them, they're not any bigger than what you'd use on a bass. Well, it's quite amazing to see those little old hooks, but they sure worked. And as you can see, it was just a continual thing all day long of those guys pulling those uh, albacore over. Every time we'd stop, there was a bunch of hookups. But it, another thing that amazed me, though, Mike, is the speed of that trolling. Yeah, they probably troll anywhere from six or seven knots to maybe as, as fast as ten knots. And you'd think that that would be too fast, but uh, the albacore is such a fast swimming fish that it's not any problem for them to catch up with it. Mike, you got one on right there. What's the weights? We didn't get the back over there. What's the weights here that you were catching? What's these size well, of fish I, that are I coming Well, I think that here? the biggest fish on the boat that day was about uh, a little, a few ounces less than 25 pounds, and I would say the average fish was probably about 17 or 18 pounds. Looks like Harold Nevitt has well, one Well, you on got there. one right here. There you yeah, are, but I, I think this one. would breaks off if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it did. You got Harold Nevitt there. Yeah, he Harold is also in your store, right? Right. And he's about to, to land one. It was a good day for a Hunters and Anglers Marine <laughs> over there. Yeah, everybody had a good trip. In fact, his nephew, Larry, that also works in the store, I think ended up catching five albacore that day. Here he comes over, Harold. Ah, there he is. That's a good one. He's got that one on a, one of those feathered jigs. Well, it yeah. shows one yeah, more thing. Any rage can go. One. I understand right. Harold right. just celebrated his 70th birthday That's today. Right. All right? That's right. Boy, look at that pole. I mean, that is stout. <laughs> Boy. I think that's his nephew. Larry's got one on there. It just takes you around the boat, too. Well, Larry no, had that's a real Larry's good dad has got one on. That's yeah. who that is. Is it? Boy. Uh, you know, I really like the albacore fish, though. Uh, Look at those things, man. They have to hit them. You might tell them they have to be brought in with a gaff. And everything in the ocean has teeth. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. Or sharp gill plates. They'll cut you up real bad. Well, besides being a good fish to catch because of the fight they put up, they're an excellent fish to eat also. I, in fact, we've given a lot of ours away, and we haven't heard anything but praises for how the fish taste. And there's a lot of ways you can cook them, and it's all good. Now, Mike, there's, you're showing them these anchovies. Yeah, there's there. a little net that we dip out some of the anchovies with. You can see about the size that, that we use for bait. See some of the different guys back in there. There's the Addingtons from Mesa. Uh, that, that's Carl Addington that has one there on the right. 
and I believe Hester has Hester. Yeah, Hester Wells has got one. Yeah, Hester's got one to the left, and then you uh, get all tangled and turn over. Uh, it's a nightmare. There's Larry Nevitt Sr. He's got one on too. Well, I've got one on there. No, that's Art Chamberlain. He's got one. I don't know his thing faded on us, but that that's Art. Uh huh. Well, Just there's Hester. Yep. Hester's got one. Well, he's, they're an amazing fish, aren't they? This is again. And Larry Matthews. I know that's yeah. that's one of the Thompsons. Okay. This is this is this is Carl Addington there with with the with. Uh, the pole in his hands, and he's got a good one on right there, a real good one. And uh, you see him way out to the side here. Now you have a little fun. You have a jackpot, don't you? The biggest fish. Yeah, we usually have a jackpot. <laughs> that makes it fun, doesn't it? Like, I think Larry Nevitt Jr. and was it Gene or, or Carl tied for the thing? It, it, it was Carl. Yeah, but you know, you, you can see by Carl there. working this thing right here. You don't horse those things in. No, you don't horse them in unless it's with the trolling rig. There you can horse them in because you've got 60-pound line on a big reel and you've only got a 20 or 30-pound fish, so you can just bring them right in. But when you're fishing with something like this, they've generally got 20-pound line on and a relatively light rig for ocean fishing. And you're right, you just don't horse them in. You have to fish. And that's why it becomes so exciting. you, you got five or six hookups, people going under each other, over each other. It was really amazing. There he gets there his is. fish in. Well, if you get a big eye tuna, you've really got to fight. Oh them yeah, hands. you bet. Sixty they're, pounders. They're twice the size of an average albacore. And they're okay. out there in the same water sure. too. Sure. You bet. There's uh, the Thompsons. There's well, Larry's big one. Aren't they pretty? Yeah. Fish, there's though? Larry. That fish there were tied for big fish honors, and uh, and that was twenty four pounds of some odd ounces. Right. Twenty four something. Yeah. Well, I think that would have been big fish, but it dried out too long, and he, he lost some weight That's on a it. nice fish. Now, explain what they're doing here, Okay, Mike. now we're heading back in, and there. this is when they have time to fillet the fish. And uh, generally speaking, you can get, if you've got a 20-pound fish, you can probably get uh, 10 to 15 pounds of fillets out of it. And They have uh, lots of meat. They have lots of meat, and the meat's just excellent. Now, the, and on this particular boat, I know the deckhands did that for three dollars. Is that right? That's right. Now, my, people might say, "Well, I, I really wouldn't want them to do that. That's pretty expensive." But it really isn't when you stop and consider. You know, you're kind of living out of a suitcase, so to speak. You're right. over there. Where do you take them to fillet them after you get That's back right. to port? That's exactly right. So it's pretty right. neat. What do you and they do sack with them? them for you. So all you have to do then is find some ice, and they've got that right on the pier. Here we see some acrobatics. When it's time from, uh, for you to buy tires. You owe it to yourself to stop in at Big O Tires. The warranty on Big O Tires is absolutely the best around. All Big O brand tires are fully warranted, no prorating, and they include road hazards, even for four wheel drive tires. Go see my friends at Big O Tires in Mesa, 1060 South Alma School Road, 420 East Main Street, 100 South Power Road. Big O Tires, top quality, fair prices, and a great warranty. You know, Mike, I was hoping they would show a little longer that, that uh, here at the conclusion, David Perkins of Mesa was standing there throwing these little old anchovies on the way in, mm -hmm. and those seagulls could pick them right out of the air as they came down. You know, people get fascinated with that. In fact, I've seen them throw hundreds of them in the air just for something to do, and everybody likes taking pictures of them. It's just fantastic to see. Well, anything about the ocean is kind of interesting. You know, if you've lived in the desert like I have all of my life here, you go over there, it's kind of a new world, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, you might mention on these, uh, these boats, they're pretty well equipped. They, f they feed the people, there's restrooms, there's everything there. In fact, if you want to buy a soda pop or if they wanted to buy beer, they could buy right. it right there. Sure. Now they, they really take care of you, and this particular boat that we went out on was a new boat, and it was refrigerated in the area where you slept and ate. And uh, it's, it's equipped you know, to really take as long a cruise as you might want to take, but you don't have to go on anything more than a one-day cruise to be able to catch albacore like we did. Well, that was pretty neat. I don't know about everybody else, but I slept all the way out there. It was <laughs> cool and nice, crawled into a bunk, and just slept all the way, and... Uh, and that was kind of, I thought, one thing that was kind of strange, I don't think there was one person, even though it was a little rough out there, that was sick at all. 
that's kind of unusual because most of the time you're going to have people that have, if you've if you've been out there you know whether you're going to get sick or not right. but if you've never been out there before you don't know and most of the time there's somebody sick on the boat and thank God there wasn't anybody sick on this boat. Yeah, they've got uh, real good medicine pills that you can buy right there at the, the shops right, when you and they, leave. And they've also got a, a prescription that you can get. It's a little round disc that goes behind your ear. You have to go to the doctor to get it. And that seems to work pretty good. Most people that get that and take it, put it on before they get on the boat usually don't have any problems. I took my kids out last year and, and we bought right at the the marina when we took off and we mm -hmm. bought it and none of us got sick. So mm -hmm. it's worth great. spending a couple of it bucks more sure on the pills. You know? sure is. Now Mike, we went about 65 miles out to sea, but as, if, if you're an, a veteran albacore fisherman, as the summer wears on, is there, do I understand it correctly that the fish start moving closer to shore? Well that's generally the way it works, although when I was over there this past weekend, uh, it really hasn't worked that way. In fact, they said the majority of the albacore are, not, are now out at about 100 miles. So it's, it seems like it's different every summer. It kind of depends on where the Japanese current's going at the time. The, the albacore hang out on the fringes of the warmer water. What do they call that, El Nino? Well, different things. Some, they call yeah, it. different things. Water but, current. But right now, the closest that any of them are catching them is about 70 miles out. Mm. And to really get into the albacore, they seem like they're having to go 100 miles. Dang, that's a long That's, that's, a, that's, long a, that's a long haul. And they were in closer when we were there. And maybe they'll be in closer when we go again in a couple of weeks. I don't know. But uh, it's, it's kind of a weird summer because usually they're in 20 to 30 miles by this time of year, and now they seem to be going back out again. Hmm. But again, it's one more reason why, if you're really going to go albacore fishing, unless you own a ocean boat, that you just about have to book on to one of these things. So if right. you're going to go out 100 miles, hey, that's a long way out to sea. And uh, you're a long way out of the side of land out there. Yeah, well, you, you better you can't know see what you're land doing. Anywhere, right. The fog sets in, you can't see anything. You're in trouble if you take a real small rig out there. Yeah, and if anything happens to it, you're in trouble, especially if you don't have a radio to get a hold of a bigger boat. That's right. Well, I was impressed by the weather. It was just beautiful over there. You know, the sun, it was kind of an overcast a little bit, but it was just as cool and pleasant all day long. Well, it's great. In fact, if you looked at the, the movie, you notice that most people were wearing some sort of a jacket all day long, and that's how cool it is out there. It's a real change from our climate here. Well, how many how many albacore did they finally take? I think we had 38 on the boat out of about. I would guess we probably had 70 to 75 hookups. So I think that's excellent for that's one a day's lot of fishing. Fighting. Right. Sure. Well. Yeah. I know my particular thing. I came down with 20 minutes to go on the trip and decided I'd throw my line in and I got a hit the second I threw it over. <laughs> right. I kept it on there about 15 minutes and I picked up everybody's line and finally they were decided they were going to have me catch it and he reached over and snipped the line and the line he snipped was mine and <laughs> I was gone. <laughs> Boy, it was, I've had that happen before. Did the sharks move in at all on No, you? I don't think we ever saw any sharks that I that I remember anyway. That adds a little excitement oh, when yeah. you hook a shark sure and you does. start bringing your albacore in half eaten. Right. Right, so, and, that, and that happens too. You bet. Well, uh, we we went over there, and, and you just took the fillets that you caught, and uh, you just bought some ice. Is that right? right. Took your, mm -hmm. you took an ice chest, threw it in mm -hmm. the back, and then threw those. They had them all right. packaged for you, and just mm -hmm. threw it in there, and you had no problem bringing them back. No, to, to didn't the have valley. any problems at all. In fact, some of the people flew over, and then got a taxi cab and, and uh, went to the boat landing, and we took their fish home for them. And it, it worked out great. Everybody got their fish, and uh, there was no spoiled fish or any problems like that. Well, there was a couple of the guys on board that uh, that didn't pay to have theirs filleted, and I don't know what they did with them yet over there in California. <laughs> I don't know either, but, you know, it seems like 50% of the people don't have their fish filleted, and I don't know how they haul them back and get them back in, in shape where they can eat them. I don't know what they do with them. Sometimes you can trade them if you have enough of them for yeah. tuna if you get yeah. in during the daylight hours. Yeah, you can trade them. Uh, I noticed when I was over there last weekend that they had signs up there that they would trade with you. It's something like uh, three pounds of albacore for one pound of canned tuna, and they would trade up until 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. But I would prefer just to have them filleted and eat them that way. I think they're better that oh, way. They're delicious. Well, I can understand, you know, uh, not having your fish filleted if you lived right there in San Diego. You could take mm -hmm. them home and sure. you'd have the means of filleting them. But I don't know what in thunder you would do with them if you stood there with, 
with four or five fish that weighed 24 pounds a piece when you got back and had a little car. I, I just don't know what you'd do. I don't know what you'd do either, but I see people all the time just throwing them in the back of their car, and yeah. I don't understand what they do with them either. Last year, I was camped out there with my family at San Diego, and we went out and came back in. We had some, and we uh, barbecued them right at the park where we stay, and they were mm -hmm. delicious grilled on the charcoal. Just think, fabulous eating. That's my favorite way of cooking them. I think they're just out of this world. Yeah. Well, Mike, I really think that this thing is a great idea, and I know it's a new innovation to the Valley to schedule tours right out of here, but I know, I know for one, I can speak for myself, I think it's great, and I'm going to be over there next year. I, I, I got tired of using that camera. I want to get out there and do some fishing. The only thing, the only exciting part for me is that when you're looking through a camera, it's like standing on, trying to stand blindfolded, you know? And I looked down through that thing in that ocean roll and I about fell off the top of that thing. Well, I don't see how you stayed up there half the time. It was hard enough just to stand up by the rail, much less stand up there with no rail around you at all. Yeah. You know, Mike, one thing people ought to be aware of, that uh, they ought to call you and get, a, get their name on a list if they want to go. Well, that, that's what we've started now. We've got a list of quite a few names. And uh, when the long time before the season starts next year, we'll be contacting people and booking the charters and we'll have anywhere from one day charters up to six day. Now the one six day we've got this year, they're going to go out for everything they can catch. They're going to spend a couple of days marlin and sail fishing and the rest of them time they'll be doing a little albacore fishing and some blue and yellow fin tuna fishing. So they'll be taking in the whole gamut of the big game fish. Well Mike, I'll tell you, we really appreciate you coming on the show. It's almost time for our update. Uh, we know you're a busy man. We appreciate what you're doing for the Valley Fishermen and setting up these things. We appreciate you being here on the show, and uh, we just thank you for taking time to do you so. Bet, Mike. Thank you. It's my pleasure. With that, we'll just go right into our update now. There's going to be an archery seminar here in the East Valley at the Mesa Centennial Hall next Monday evening. That's, that's going to be August the 5th, 7 to 10 p.m. Fiesta Archery is presenting it. Wayne Carlton from Colorado. He's an expert caller, a manufacturer of calls, and he has tapes. He does the tubes, the diaphragms. He is one of the top national elk callers in the country, and he's coming down from Colorado to be at the seminar, along with Dwight Shue, who's the Western editor for Fins and Feathers magazine. And they'll both be here, and, and, and they're really good. Dwight Shue is a walking encyclopedia when it comes to elk, and he's got quite a few books on the market, and he's written in some of the national magazines, Outdoor Life, and many others on elk. Also, there will be an outfitter from Colorado down. You'll have a meat company. Uh, you'll have a taxidermy. Um, so come out, contact Fiesta Archery for more information. The Mesa Varmint Callers, the very next night, is going to have Al LeCount from the Game and Fish Department uh, talking on bear, and along with Reed Peterson, who's here on the show, and he's going to tell you how to call him in with a varmint call. He's called in over 50 bear now, so if you'd like to come, it's going to be held at the PAL Adult Center, 655 East Southern in Tempe. Starts at uh, 7 o'clock p.m. There will be a slight charge at the door of $5 per person to help the club out and to rent the facilities. There's an excellent surface bite at Apache Lake right now if you go up real early in the morning, starting about 4.30 to 7, and use little Rapala lures. Floyd Priest was just up and it was excellent. Reed and I accompany him. We'll show you a show later on on this. By next week, you should know if you got drawn. We wish you good luck. Reed, why don't you tell them good hunting? Well, good hunting and have a real pleasant week. Nobody likes to buy tires. For some, it's a frightening experience. For others, it's time-consuming. And there are those who end up paying just too much. But at Big O Tires, we do it better. 
Big O Tire's professionally trained specialists will handle all of your tire needs. And with Big O Tire's express lane service, most cars are in and out in 20 minutes or less. Get the best product for the best price. Get that Big O feeling of confidence. I'm Ned Smith. And I'm Reed Peterson, welcoming you in behalf of our fine sponsor, Big O Tires, to Arizona Outdoors. Last week we took you 65 miles off the coast of San Diego for a How to Do It show on albacore fishing. With the 1985 fall big game permits in the hands of the sportsmen, the primary interest of most sportsmen is switched from fishing to hunting. Ned, would you introduce this week's show? Be glad to, Reed. This week we're going to go out to Maricopa County's Usury Mountain Archery Range. That's just east of Mesa on Usury Pass. And boy, it's a nice facility, one of the finest in the nation, Reed, and we have it right here in our backyard. Well, we're going to take them out there primarily to introduce the fundamentals of bow hunting. And Ned, Today, the name of the game is bow hunting. Its popularity has grown so fast here in the valley that it's just literally unbelievable. Too fast, Reed. You and I couldn't even draw an archery <laughs> permit. I can't believe that happened to us yet, Ned. You're but we got shut out. You're not a kid. We're going to have to go to Colorado. That's what it looks like. Well, you know, out here on the range now, it's one of the best there is. So, and these fundamentals are important, aren't they, Reed, to the archery? Well, they certainly are, especially to people just beginning. But, uh, in the, in the game of bow hunting, the game is practice. Get it right, start with correct fundamentals, and, and get with the program. Now, Ned, right off, we're going to run things a little bit different. We're going to switch to a, a commercial, followed right by, and get right into our tape from there. Let's go do it. Hi, Reed Peterson here. If there's one thing I hate to have on a trip, it's trouble with my tires. About a year ago, I bought a set of big old tires, as you can see here. And without question, they're the best set of tires I've ever owned, and I've bought quite a few over the years. I got top quality at a fair price, and you can too. Visit my friends at Big O Tires in Mesa, 420 East Main, 1060 South Alma School Road, and 100 South Power. I'm here at the Maricopa County Usury Park Archery Range with a couple of real veteran archers. Uh, I'd like to introduce right to you at this time Mr. Dick Tone and Kevin Erlinson. Dick, as most people around the valley are aware of, uh, deals in archery equipment, is a jobber for that, is that correct, Dick? A manufacturer's a rep. A manufacturer's That's rep. Correct. And Kevin Erlinson, of course, is the owner of Fiesta Archery. Now, we're here for specific, a specific purpose this morning. And uh, we're really glad to have you guys on the show. Let well, we appreciate that. it, Reed. And sure uh, do. We're going to see if we can't get some things accomplished here to help the bull hunters out. Okay, as as you gentlemen are aware, I think the the die has been cast and uh, the big great computer in the sky has spoken, and now all the permits are out. And those guys that were fortunate enough to receive a uh, an elk permit and some of these other permits. Uh, Time becomes real critical at this point. Is that not true? It's sure showing up at the store. I hate to ask you this, Reed, but did you get drawn? <laughs> I would like to put to some kind of rust on that computer's gears. <laughs> well, I'm in the same group, but it doesn't matter whether you get drawn here or whether you plan to hunt in Colorado or whether you plan to hunt in Montana or what. You still got to get ready. And in order to get ready, in my opinion, you should be ready all year round. And I keep a tackle box right here ready, and I've got all my hunting stuff in it, and I can pick this tackle box up and I can go at a moment's notice anywhere in the country, and I'm ready. Now, there's a few little odds and ends that I do every year to get ready, and along with practice, but basically, any time of year, somebody calls me on the phone, I can go hunting. I'm ready. Well, Dick, you think one of the major mistakes, or at least I do, and I'm sure that you share this, that 
Many, many archers make, especially, or bow hunters, especially novice ones, is that they think that all they've got to do is, is pick up a bow with a week, uh, week to go and they can go out and be proficient in the field. Reed, that's true. That's basically true. Uh, when you're shooting a bow, it takes hours and hours of practice. It doesn't matter whether you're shooting a, a recurve or you're shooting a compound or what. You still have to get out there and practice. And part of my practice is not only shooting the bow, but getting my equipment in shape. And I check over my tackle box here, and these are my practice arrows, which I, I'll be out there shooting here in a little while. And then down on the bottom here, I have a spare hunting bow. I've got uh, some extra bowstrings and some extra broadheads, uh, animal call or two, and uh, various different odds and ends, extra quiver parts, things that you might need when you're out there and on the bow hunt. Because you get out there and you're 100 miles from any archer shop, or sometimes 500 miles, you got to be able to be self-sufficient, and that's what this tackle box does for me. Well, you know, I, I think I'm really guilty of, of making a terrible mistake in answer to what you're saying here, because, you know, I don't think that I'm totally self-sufficient, and I'd hate to think of some of the things that could happen to me out there, and, and here I'm up in the middle of an elk hunt that I've waited a year for, which I'm not going to have this year, keep throwing that in, but anyway, uh, and then have something happen, and then you're totally out of it. Well, I kind of relate it to the rifle hunters, and if you're out there rifle hunting and you're in the, in the middle of nowhere and you've only got one bullet with you uh, and you shoot that bullet or you lose it, you're in trouble. The same with the bowstring. If you only have one bowstring and it breaks, you're in trouble. You're out of bullets. And you should have a backup bow. You should have a backup rifle if you go on a deer hunt. Well, that's a pretty neat setup you have there. It is. It is really nice. I noticed that you even have your flu-flu arrow. You have everything there. Yeah, I keep a few flu-flus around. They're fun around camp. And uh, there's always a squirrel or two that are open during archery season. And you can screw on a, a, a blunt tip or anything you want on the end of these. And it, it makes it for a lot of fun. Well, Kevin, we've kind of kept you out of the conversation here for a minute. Uh, Kevin, I imagine in your shop this time of year, things are getting kind of hectic because uh, the interest in, in uh, bull hunting is certainly going to take an upswing. Yes, Rick. What's happening right now is most people are starting to receive their tags, and they're coming down, and they're starting to get really set up. The seasoned archer that keeps up year-round has been rejuvenated. He's coming in looking for his last-minute little things. And the archer that we're trying to appeal to today, the archer that we're trying to get out in the field earlier and get him practicing more, is just now starting to come in to purchase their new bows and get their arrows put together and this sort of thing. Well, we're here at Usury Park. I think the people of Maricopa County are, are truly blessed in that, I, as I understand it, and I am no expert in this field, but we have one of the finest uh, outdoor ranges probably available anywhere in the country, right here in our own backyard. Is that not true? I really believe it. I've been in a lot of different states, and I've shot in a lot of different courses, and this is one of the finest that I've ever seen. Well, why don't we just take it from there and... Uh, Go up on the range and, and see what some of these facilities are and then take some pointers on, uh, on from, from you experts on what some of these fellows could do to improve their bow hunting skills. Sounds good. Well, Dick, when a person first comes up here and uses the range, you might have a little difficulty understanding the fact that not always is there somebody right here on duty. It's, it's kind of a, an honor system when they put their money in, a, in into the uh, little box there. Yeah, you can see from the, the signs that Ned's uh, taking pictures over here, it is well marked. And uh, there is a $2 fee to shoot and a $50 annual pass. And uh, uh, this is just helps with the upkeep of the range and, and keeping it one of the best ranges in the country. You know, when they put their $2 into this thing, Dick, uh, they can shoot all day here. Oh, yeah. It's it's open. They've got courses for, for bow hunting, for target archery, and even a broadhead course. I understand why they have about four ranges around here. Yeah, at least. And uh, one of the things I will mention, though, one of the most important things a person can do to get ready is to practice with your broadheads. And this is a good place to do it. They have a range that you can actually shoot around with your broadheads. Yeah, there's not many places that you can actually practice with a broadhead, no. especially in your backyard. You're usually just not equipped for anything like that. No, it's very tough. So.
good place to do it. Well, let's just move right up on the range now and uh, see if we can get some pointers from you guys. Super. Also join us this morning on this little round. We'll have Jack Lyons from Mesa and John Gurisich from Tempe. Glad to have you guys here on Arizona Outdoors as well. Here. Nice to be here. Well, let's just move right ahead then and we'll move right up on the range. You guys ready? Ready. All right, well, let's go. of one of the ranges. What is this called here, Kevin? Do you know? Okay, we're now here at the uh, sight in practice range. And this range is designed for coming out and sighting in your bow before you go out onto the regular broadhead course. And as you can see, we have concrete pillars here and all the distances are marked off on the bales. And you look around to the very fur less, furthest left target and you'll see a mound of dirt. And that's so you can sight in with the actual broadheads here before you go out onto the unmarked range. Well, this is a pretty nice, a nice facility here. All weather conditions or anything else, it's, it's really nice. Uh, I noticed that uh, as you look out across there, you're talking about the, the hump of dirt way, way out there for the, for the broadhead range. Right. That's a good distance out there, isn't it? Of course, they've got stations marked all the way out, out to it. Right. Uh, and this is just one of four or five ranges here, is that right? Yes, it is, and it's a very well put together range. Well, what range are we going to should we, Are we going to go around the whole things, or are we going to just start with one particular range this morning, or what are we going to shoot? Well, I believe we ought to start on one range here, get a sight setting, and then go out on the course. All right, let's get her done. Okay, well, here we're under, under the edge of the covered canopy here, and uh, this part of the course, they're just zeroing in their bows before starting any of the animal ranges or anything, just to be sure that their, their uh, bow is shooting the way they want it to, and this is just basically a tune-up before starting any of the courses. And the way they're pepping around that bull, they don't need much tuning up. Okay, we're looking right over the jack's shoulder here as he zeroes in his bow, and that couldn't have been more dead centered if he'd carried it up there and poked it in. <laughs> okay, we're here on the marked animal range in this part of the Usury Park course. Uh, in this particular course, uh, we have a mark cemented in telling the, uh, telling the bow hunter just exactly how far that they're going to shoot. And uh, later on, we'll cover a course that, that has a, the same animal uh, targets that is unmarked. But at the present time, this is marked. OK. As John prepares to fire here, we're standing here at the 21-yard pin, as you can see. And our target down below is a turkey. Watch Dick over here fire at the same thing. A little bit right. Really a nice morning out here, Ned. It's beautiful. Hey, this is the coolest you can almost feel a, a touch of fall in the air with that cool breeze coming over there. So we watch these four archers go down there, or bow hunters go down and pull their, their uh, arrows from that turkey. And then we'll move right on up the range. Also joining us here this morning, Ned, we finally have Larry Matthews. Larry, what's the matter with your alarm <laughs> clock, for crying out loud? It was really comfortable with the bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, of all the people I know in the valley, I don't know of a man who I consider deem more of an expert in this field than Larry. He's won so many uh, archery contests that it's... It's just unbelievable. Larry, we're glad to have you with us, even if you come in here wandering when the thing's half over. Uh, while we're talking to you, Jack, Jack, I understand that you've taken some 65 animals now. Well, I have made your big game animals with a bow. That's the only way I've ever hunted is with a bow. And that brings us to a point. You know, one of the big mistakes that, that novice archers make, as I understand in, in our conversation, that they want to fire an arrow at everything they see. Uh, 
distances are extremely important in, in keeping your uh, arrows in a kill area. Right. Uh, learn how far away you are proficient with your bow and limit yourself to that distance. Uh, like I said, I've taken quite a few animals, bear, antelope, deer, elk, and etc. with a bow, and I've never taken an animal or shot an animal over 40 yards away. I prefer 20 yards is my distance, but I'm under 40 yards, never over 40 yards would I even shoot at an animal. Well, when you, you hear that coming from an expert, it's really important. You know, I, I spent quite a bit of time in the field recently with Larry Jones, who many consider one of the top foremost bow hunters in the country, and, and Larry has set a 20 yard maximum for himself. He just says, I won't shoot one over 20 yards, I can't afford to wound one. Absolutely. There's no reason to. And if you shoot within yourself, you know your abilities. If you don't, if you're not good enough at those abilities, practice, practice, practice. That's what it takes. Well, what it sounds to me like then, Jack, that you have a, a, a twofold part of uh, bow hunting that's extremely important. You better know the distance at which you are proficient with a bow, and then if you're not, if you can't shoot any far than that, you better increase your stalking skills and other things and get in close enough that you can do some good. That's, that's right. The name of the game is hunting, not killing, and getting closer to the animals is the, that's the most fun anyway. Well, that brings us to a point here, and we can just take time to talk about it. You can, all you guys join in us. Uh, I gather then that camouflage is the name of the game in bow hunting. Absolutely. Yes, I believe that camouflage is a very important thing, and it must blend into your environment. Each different environment you go to requires a different camouflage. Lighter camouflages for your desert hunting, and darker camouflages for your more wooded forest hunting. Yeah, I think we sometimes get the idea that camouflage means OD, and uh, to make a, a, a simple statement on that where they would really understand it, you know, in snow that thing would stand out like a sore thumb. And what you're saying, if, if you're in the desert, so would OD again would stand out, and rather than blend in with the environment. That's so correct. whatever area you're hunting, you you may as a bow hunter be required to have a number of different types of, of camouflage outfits. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and also think it's very important that you cut any shine, like on exposed parts of your hands and exposed parts of your face. The shine will alert an animal just as much as an odd color. Uh, I understand one of the major errors many, many bow hunters make is not worrying about their watch. And a watch is a dead giveaway whether it's with a bow or a rifle. And uh, they have that watch to shine for miles. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Oh, that's true. It works just like a uh, mirror that you would use as a signal. It's very visible for many, many miles. And the animals are alerted to that. Hey guys, let's just move on to the next one. Okay. You know, Jack, we're talking about preparation and, and getting these, especially these novice hunters, prepared. How important is preparation to you? Well, I work, I shoot my bow all year round because I thoroughly enjoy it and it's a good form of recreation. But you work very hard all year. You put in for your tag. You hope you get drawn. And you may only have one shot for the whole year. And so you want to be make sure you do it and get it right. It's a, you know, a one-time deal. Well, that's for sure. Uh, Right now, why don't you guys just cut a loo cut loose here, and uh, we have a, a little a little buck here as a as a target, and let's see what we can do. Okay, we're shooting at about 25 yards, which is a fair distance to a deer. Okay, we're down here where we can see the impact of these arrows as they hit the target. Now, the idea, of course, a kill is going to have to be inside of that ring. see the importance of what practice does to these top archers. Well, Dick, uh, you guys walk around this Usury Park range. What, uh, what uh, part does physical condition play in bow hunting? Very big part. Uh, one of the most important parts about hunting is getting in physical shape, having your cardiovascular system working well because you're going to leave the valley at a couple thousand feet and go out hunting at eight, nine, ten thousand feet, some, sometimes higher. And uh, a couple days will tell its toll up there. You won't be ready. You're going to spend all this time and all this money and get up there hunting, and you're going to feel terrible and not be ready to hunt if you're not in good shape. Well, you just advocate them before they even worry about uh, 
their accuracy or well right along with it is just right as important to get out and get in physical condition right along with it yeah you can run or swim or uh, ride a bike uh, jump rope there's a lot of things you can do anything to work on your cardiovascular system you bet well i can understand that that would be important because i'll tell you you cover some ground and uh, you walk around this entire area out here I understand this course is a mile and a half long, just on this one on this one uh, range. You'll you'll know it if you're yeah, out of shape. I see a lot of people out here that are walking around. They're puffing, just walking around out here, and just think how it'd be if you had to be hunting all day long. Same thing. And then after you get one down, the fun's over and the work begins, right? I tell you, all in all, <laughs> big mothers out of there is really tough. <laughs> <laughs> I should say, and I don't care. That includes anything from a deer on up. It is a, a lot of work. Well, okay. Uh, let's just move along. Well, Larry, if uh, a novice hunter was new at this bull, uh, bull hunting, what would you give him? What, what advice would you give him as far as preparation is concerned, and are getting started? I'd probably seek advice from some professional or pro shop that has somebody that can give you the instructions and you may keep it simple and you may go you know with a lot of stuff on your bow but the main thing is what you can handle. And basically you think that it's important that you get instructions that are proper not Correct. just go out on your own and, and keep compounding the same errors. Well John as we approach another stand here uh, Dick Tone tells me that you're relatively new to, to bow hunting. What, what drew your interest to the, this particular sport? That's right, Reed. I, I started bow hunting three years ago, and uh, I started bow hunting for two reasons. First of all, it extended my hunting season. Uh, I think by bow hunting, I can hunt earlier and hunt later, hunt more game, and I've got a, a uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely relying on the permit system. I can hunt deer uh, in December, I can hunt deer in Haveline in January, and uh, just pull my tag. Uh, the second reason is, I think the reason why an awful lot of people hunt is it gives you additional time to have camaraderie with people that you enjoy. Well, I don't think there's any question, John, that, that the popularity of archery and our bow hunting is going to continue to grow from one standpoint alone. The fact that it really, they really don't affect uh, the game that we're hunting, it has very, very little effect upon, our, uh, upon the potential of our, of our big game herds. And uh, consequently, talking about man hours, you can put just 10 times as many man hours uh, of people as far as bow hunters are concerned that you can with rifle hunters without hurting your, your uh, game at all. That's true, Reed. I feel I've shot for, or I've hunted for three years, and I have not had much of an effect on the game in this state. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's all of us. <laughs> well, let's move on down. Okay. Well, you sometimes run into these out there when you're hunting, you know. One dead yodi. Well, Kevin, you know, a novice hunter goes out and, uh, to start into this thing. He first thing he has to do is get him some uh, archery equipment, and he'll, he'll go out and buy a bow. Now, what is your advice to people buying a bow to start with? Well, Reed, I would suggest that uh, any person wanting to buy archery equipment go into a local pro shop, whether it be my store or anybody else's store in the valley handle the equipment, buy what's comfortable and fits them properly. You know, one of the big errors that I understand a lot of uh, young bowmen make is that they, they go in and think right now they want to be macho man and go get some 85 pound bow and they can't hardly handle a 40 pound and then they're in trouble right off. Is that correct? Yes, this happens quite often. You get a guy that buys a bow to impress somebody and uh, obviously it's not himself because he can't shoot the bow properly and he doesn't take the time to strengthen himself to be able to handle that kind of a weight. Okay, thanks Kevin. Well, let's just move on then. Well, Dick, uh, out here also on this Usury Pass range, they have uh, 3D targets so that you can use a broadhead. Is, is it important for the novice bow hunter to use, uh, practice with these broadheads? Is there a difference in the flight? 
Oh, definitely. Uh, the broadheads will fly a lot different than your than your field points. Now, you have field points that will be weighted the same as your broadheads, but that doesn't assure the fact they're going to go in the same spot. Generally, a broadhead will fly either left or right of a, of a field point, and usually slightly higher. So you need to get out and practice with your broadheads, especially if you're a sight shooter, because you need to find out whether your sight settings are the same. You might just be simple as changing your windage. but. Uh, I always carry some broadheads with me, and if I get a chance to practice on the range, I do so. And that's what we're going to do now. Well, what do we got down there? Havelina hidden in the brush. A big one, and he put him right in the middle of the kill zone. Well, Reed, looks like we got lucky this time. Put one right where it belongs. Holy cow, that, they weren't kidding. That is right in the dead center of that kill zone, wasn't it? And you notice how easy they come out of those kind of targets. Uh, those targets are made there in uh, Gilbert, Arizona. Matter of fact, uh, Gilbert Archery has those targets. And they're good for practicing with broadheads. And you can take them up to camp with you and practice up there. Or if you don't have a target, you can use a dirt bank. Make sure you don't have any rocks in it. Uh, you made one point a while ago I'd like to enlarge on. It is important, however, to be sure that your field point and, and your uh, broadhead are the same weight in green. Is that correct? Exactly. There's a lot of different sizes of arrows and different diameters and different weight broadheads, and the field points are designed so that they match the broadheads within a few grains. You know, three or four or five grains doesn't make a lot of difference. Okay, that's great. Well, Dick, Kevin... John, Jack, hey, we really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to come out here and, and give some of the novice bow hunters a little instruction on how to begin this tremendous sport. When it's time for you to buy tires, you owe it to yourself to stop in at Big O Tires. The warranty on Big O Tires is absolutely the best around. All Big O brand tires are fully warranted, no prorating, and they include road hazards, even for four-wheel drive tires. Go see my friends at Big O Tires in Mesa, 1060 South Alma School Road, 420 East Main Street, 100 South Power Road. Big O Tires, top quality, fair prices, and a great warranty. You know, Reed, it shows in this tape here with these experts that it's very, very important to get out and really practice and, and seek the advice of a pro. Well, in all facets of hunting, practice is the name of the game, Ned. And, you know, I really appreciated these guys taking out of their time and coming out there and going through this with them. Archery, bull hunting is here to stay. Hey, it's the one uh, outdoor activity in hunting where you really don't hurt your wildlife resource. And, boy, you can really pour the people to it. So it's just going to do nothing but grow, Ned. Oh, I'm sure it will, Reed. Uh, uh, it's just evident, you know, there's three million people in Arizona, and what are we going to go to? Well, they're going to have to go to bow hunting because this population is not going to stop coming. We're not going to harm the resource in any way, any time. So all I can say is, uh, you know, everybody ought to get a bow and, and start going out and getting practice up, and the range is a great one. Let's go to the update right now. 85,000 hunters are happy. They drew a permit somewhere in Arizona to hunt, but many are in mourning like Reed and I. We couldn't even draw an archery elk permit. But there's some hope for some of, the, of you out there. There's still 20,000 deer permits left. You should contact the Arizona Game and Fish Department, or if you'll just pick up the Mesa Tribune and read the outdoor page, we've got it on there tonight. Now, next week on our show, which will be at 8 o'clock for one week only, and then we'll come back to our regular time, it'll be an elk calling show and tips on hunting. Our out-of-state guests will be Wayne Carlton from Colorado, an expert caller, and Dwight Shu from Oregon, an author of many books and magazines on elk. You know, Ned, they were here in the valley last week and put on an elk calling seminar that was just dynamite. It was they're, they're, they're really super, and if anybody missed that seminar, they really should watch this show because they're great. I'm Ned Smith. And I'm Reed Peterson, wishing you good hunting, good fishing, and have a very pleasant week.
I've got enough on my mind without worrying about tires. We think you've got enough on your mind without worrying about tires. Once you're on Big O Tires, they can't cost you another penny. Not for service, repair, or replacement. Because as long as you have legal tread, we'll repair them or replace them free. Even road hazards. We can't solve all your problems. But isn't it nice to have one less to worry about? Once you buy Big O Tires, there's nothing left to buy. 